Namaste, warm greetings to each and every one of you who's watching us live. My name is Ruben, and on behalf of Team Dentist Channel dot online, it's my pleasure and a privilege to invite all you lovely people who've joined us for this session. Today is the second day of the world's first virtual implant expo, and we are on a marathon to make sure that you're learning simply the best from the world of implant dentistry. Once again, we have a very special speaker all the way from Berlin, Germany. A topic that is the future of dentistry. This is not just about India. This is not just about the Middle East. This is not just about the Europe. I think this is the future of implant dentistry all across the globe. And this is what you would understand in, in a short while from now. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor and privilege to invite and welcome and introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Elisa Praderi, representing Form Labs. A short introduction about our speaker. Uh, she graduated in dentistry in the year 2017 from Universidad Católica del Uruguay. She's worked at the university's emergency service and in private dental practice since the last three years. She's conducted a research study in the area of aesthetic dentistry, which she presented in the 96th general session and exhibition of the IADR as the Unilever Hatton Award competitor. In the year 2019, she joined Form Labs as the clinical protocols and KOL manager, where she focuses on clinical workflows, integrating 3D printing technology, new dental materials, and connecting with experts in the field. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting to you, Dr. Elisa Life. Thank you so much, Ruben. I will now start projecting my screen. So I hope that you can see it. Uh, perfect. So, uh, Ruben, wait a minute. Can you let me share my screen? Apologies. Um, perfect. You should yes. now be able to see my screen. Yes, that's Correct. perfect. Perfect. Wait a minute that I was missing. Perfect. So we're ready. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much, Ruben, and thank you so much, dentalchannel.online, for ha giving the opportunity to present at the world's first virtual dental implant expo. Uh, I want to first say good afternoon, good evening to everyone that's joining today. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting a topic that I'm uh, very passionate about and I hope that uh, a lot of you are interested in this today about 3D printing in implantology. Uh, we're going to be having an overview about workflow materials and applications. So I have 35 minutes. I try to make it as interesting as possible for you today. And of course, we will be having a Q&A section at the end uh, to address any of the concerns that you might have or any questions. So I won't stop this here because Ruben already introduced me, but yes, I'm a trained dentist and I'm part of the Formlabs dental team. So today we're going to be talking about the 3D printing basics, about digital dentistry workflow for surgical guides production, including 3D printing, about other applications that can be used for implantology, a very basic overview, and about in-house production and outsourcing the different steps of the digital workflow, and we will round up with some conclusions for this session. So first of all, I want to start this session talking about 3D printing basics. But before getting specifically into 3D printing, I want to establish a clear difference because I don't know if maybe of you are already familiarized with 3D printing or not, because uh, I, for example, was trained with conventional workflows and I guess that most of you out there today have also been trained in dental school with conventional workflows and had to adopt the digital workflow or adopting intro scanning or adopting planning or manufacturing stage. So when I first started this topic it was very interesting for me to understand the differences between the different manufacturing procedures and this includes the additive and subtracting manufacturing process. So first of all subtracting manufacturing is something that we already are familiarized with because we have been in contact with milling machines for quite some while now. And we know that subtracting manufacturing, as the word says, it's the process that we, we will build objects by removing material to create this part. So we might have the burrs, we might have a block, and the burrs will um, remove the excess parts to create the object. But additive manufacturing is a different procedure where we know that the process is to build objects by adding material layer by layer. So, Though these approaches are fundamentally different, 
Subtracted and additive manufacturing processes are often used side by side because they have some overlap, overlapping range of applications. And maybe we can use 3D printing for something, subtracting manufacturing for other part of our clinical case. There are different ways of combining this technology. But you will see that additive manufacturing is normally refer less 3D printing. And one of the curious things to know that when we talk about additive manufacturing and building layer by layer, we need to understand these principles of the technology because this is how our part is going to be created. So just like we're trained to know how to prepare our plaster to pour a model or our different parts uh, that we create in the, in the clinical practice or a dental lab, we also need to understand what is the process behind this in order to make afterwards decisions of, okay, I will print in the layer height specifically or not. So we need to bear this in mind. So the printing process layer by layer looks like this. And as you see here, we have to the same object, but there are some differences. And this difference relies on taller or smaller layers. And how is this different in the final printed part? So we need to understand two things. So having smaller layers will allow us to have a very nice surface finish, because if you see here in the border, the transition between each of the layers is much more, you don't see it that much. But in the other one, taller layers, the, these layer lines are much more visible. So if you're looking, for example, to do a restorative model, a removable dye model, that you know that you need to see perfectly the preparation line, for example, of, of a tooth that you prepared, or you need to really have the, the, the implant correctly registered, you need to know that, that sometimes that model, you need a very high precision. And that is when you would choose for smaller layer heights, because it will allow you to have a very nice surface finish. But what is maybe the counterpart of this procedure of maybe having smaller layer lines? So if you see, this is the same object, but more layer lines, this means that the printing time will increase. So you always in 3D printing need to take the decision of, okay, this is an application where I need to have a very nice surface finish, or this is an application where I need to have the printed part very fast, or where can I find the right balance between a very nice surface finish and printing time? and to obtain the best part possible. So this is very important to bear in mind because this is the basis of 3D printing and the, uh, and the concept of being, building a part layer by layer. So overall, just to, I'm not going to talk about all of this, but just when I first started to, to explore the 3D printing uh, area, I didn't realize that there were so many processes of additive manufacturing technologies. And I'm not going to be getting into details into the whole of this. We're only going to focus on one type, but just to let you know that this is a new uh, area for us in dentistry, and that is we're going to start hearing more and more in the future. So overall, what we need to understand is that we, these are a very, the most common types of 3D printing today if we need to classify one. So we have the categories of bed polymerization, power bed fusion, material extrusion, and material jetting. Today, I just put some definitions here so you see a little bit the difference. But today I'm going to be focusing specifically on bad polymerization that include the categories of SLA and DLP. So this is a category as we see here in the screen over the left side. So if you want to learn more also about other uh, types of 3D printing, I left here, uh, 3D Hubs has a very nice article and resources that you can uh, consult to explore more the different uh, additive manufacturing poses that there are. So first of all, what is important to understand that Bat polymerization, that is the process that we're going to talk today, basically consists of having a liquid resin that is going to be hardening by uh, light because the, this is the same principle as we see in composites. There's going to be the photopolymerization process where this resin will be, become a printed part in the end by the exposure of this light. And within the bad polymerization categories, we have different types of subcategories that vary a little bit on the technology or how the light is projected overall. So basically we have SLA, LFS, DLP, uh, and LED that are all fundamentally the same things. And there are a lot of different brands of printers that use this specific type of technology. So overall, what is important to know then is that there are some differences as we see that we saw before between SLA and DLP. So just to let you know, this is why you need to do a very ex uh, extensive research before you acquire 3D printing or when you try to understand why the time varies or why the, print, the surface finish is also different. This is, you need to really analyze what the technology is behind this. And when we look at DLP, we see that we have DLP 
overall the technology uses a projector screen to project layers of squared voxels. So basically for DLP, uh, the, uh, the image is projected at one time, but they use these little square structures that uh, look like sort of pixels, but they're called voxels. Instead, uh, low force stereolithography is a lay 3D printing. It uses laser and constant light scanning in small increments. So the difference that you will see here is a much smoother surface finish as you see here in the image in the bottom. So overall, this is also one when you need to decide, oh, do I want this brand printer or another one? We need to understand what are the bases and how um, the technology will affect the final printed part overall. So coming back to uh, what will be uh, SLA and, and low force stereolithography, why does low force stereolithography appear like a different technology between in the bad polymerization family? So basically what we need to understand is that a high, uh, what, this is the build platform that we see here in number four, and there is this resin tank that has liquid resin. So how would the printing process would look like? So overall, this build platform will descend to the resin tank, will leave a small layer compressed that will be the layer line that we decided the height, and it will be cured by a laser that is going to be under here in the in number eight area, and it will start hardening the part, and the printed object will be printed upside down. So overall, what happens? When the build platform, that is where the object will be constructed, needs to separate from the resin tank that contains liquid resin, the issue that happens is that normally high forces event occur. So it is very important to bear in mind that if we didn't add supports that we're going to see later in the presentation, if we do not support our structure correctly and that high force event applies to the printed part, maybe our printed part collapses from the build platform and can stay in the tank and it will be a, a overall mess. But the important thing to understand here is that this technology comes in order to target this force, in order to be able to, to reduce the forces applied to the printed part. So overall, what happens if, and we look at this to this animation, the printed process will look like this. So the build platform descends to the resin tank, a laser comes from underneath and cures the resin that is left between the tank, and, sorry, the build platform and the bottom of the tank. And as the tank now today has a flexible part, this is referring, for example, to form labs, uh, the, and the light projected is always perpendicular to the printed part, we see that the printed part will be easier to separate from the resin tank and each layer that is printed overall. So this is the basis uh, of low force stereolithography process. And what is important also to bear in mind is that how is this become a benefit to the overall printed part? So if uh, the amount of forces are reduced to the printed part, that means that the support structures that we add to the printed part don't need to be that rigid, don't need to be that strong in the sense that we can use like lighter touch supports. And that translates in clinically and in post-processing and in practice management that to remove the support structures as we see in this animation, for example, in a denture base, it becomes uh, less of a hassle. Now we can remove the support structures as we see here with the hand in a much more easier way that allows for faster finishing. It's just removing and maybe the polishing required is less intensive. So we need to understand the technology in order to see how it would jeopardize or how it will affect uh, the rest of the parts of the workflow, which are post-processing and polishing to deliver the part to the patient. So overall, that is the macro introduction of 3D printing to understand the basis. So again, if you have any questions, we will target in the Q&A section. But now getting more into the details about digital dentistry workflow with 3D printing for surgical guide production. Before getting specifically on how the workflow would look like, I want just, just to make a brief reference to what uh, publications and professionals are saying about this. So as you may know, implant dentistry and together with guided surgery, navigation surgery has already been around for quite some while now. But today, fabricating surgical guides before maybe needed to be delegated to a central manufacturer, or you can send it to the lab today. But today with 3D printing, there are research studies that actually say that the accuracy obtained is actually much related to the quality that you get from central manufacturers, for example. But what is the advantage overall is a cost-effective advantage, but overall for us, what is critical is time saving. So sometimes we need to turn around times it's actually very important for us to come with a solution 
that we can maybe delegate the design or do it in-house, but then we can print the part in our practice. So we avoid having transportation in between. But also, and this is related to the quote on the right from Greenberg, uh, what is important to understand is that 3D printing is part of a bigger picture of the digital workflow. We need to understand that today we have uh, imaging tools that are much more sophisticated and we have different software tools to be used and it's a logical part of the digital workflow to have also surgical guides in order to guarantee the correct implant placement of what we planned in the software. So we need to understand uh, surgical guides and implantology and in within the scope of a digital workflow. So this workflow, how it would look like. Basically, we will divide it into four steps. Uh, today I'm going to be focusing on manufacturing, but I will briefly talk about how the, how the process will look like from scanning and plan and design. So first, when you scan, you would take your intraoral scanner if you already have it, or maybe you take a normal impression and then your lab uses a desktop scanner to scan the model. Then what is very important, we, use a, we, we take a CBCT in order to have the full information to plan our surgery. And after we have that, that digital input of our patient, we need to do the planning and design stage. So for example, this would look like we have our CBCT, we also have an intraoral scan, which we exported from the software. In the CBCT, as you already know, we need to identify the noble anatomical structures and evaluate the bone density and what is going to be the, the prosthetically driven implant positioning or consider any other variables that the CBCT is giving, providing us. For example, here, as we see, is a, a, an example of three shape. And we also need to understand that we need to, after combining the data, as we're going to see the CBCT and the intro scanner, uh, we need to plan our surgical guide upon that. And as part of the application guides that Formless has, uh, for example, this is for a uh, three-shape implant studio, uh, there are different parameters to consider, of course, according to the implant system that's going to be used and to the software that you're using, but there are different uh, establishments for at least a surgical guide that's going to be used by Formlabs what wall thickness you need, what's the offset from, uh, from teeth recommended, and the offset from the sleeve. So overall, once you have that data, then we proceed to, we have the, let's say, combination of all our data and how our surgical guide will look like. Then we're ready we, to export this file, which we need in order to get into the 3D printing workflow per se. So how will the manufacturing stage with 3D printing will look like? Basically, there will be consisting of four critical steps. So first of all, it's material selection. Uh, then we need to import our file to another software, which will allow us to orientate the part so it can be printed in the printer. Then we have the printer stage, which the, will, the object will be printed, and then with the post-processing stage. So first of all, if we look at the first stage, the material selection. What is critical in this step and why we need to understand? So uh, we're dealing here uh, with a material that's going to be in contact with our, our patient dentition and mucosal structures. So we need to know that we, we need a material that's going to be biocompatible. And for example, it's a class one material, as we see here, surgical guide and dental SG registered uh, in Europe and in the US. It needs to be autoclavable because we, we will be using this in a surgical context. And the difference between surgical guide and dental SG by form labs is that there are different generations of resins where surgical guide resin is a resin that is uh, in-house manufactured by Formlabs and dental SG, uh, it's a previous generation that we already had for uh, some years ago. So another important thing to also analyze is the difference in the mechanical properties, where the new generation resin, which is a surgical guide resin, has better flexural strength and flexural modulus. So we can, can guarantee that during the surgical procedure, we know that the material will have the uh, adequate mechanical properties even better than dental SG in order to perform the surgery and not cracking during the procedure. So it's very important to bear in mind that these are the characteristics that you need to look for a material that's going to be biocompatible and not going to harm our patient. After we choose the material, and also we need to understand that uh, we need to see that the material is also according to in what range we print with that layer height, that the accuracy for that application is good. And for example, when doing this accuracy study, for full architectural surgical guide printed in 100 microns, uh, that is uh, the height of the layer height, we see that we have a, a surface in accuracy range of 94%, which is very good and sufficient for this application. So once we selected the material, we see that it's adequate for this procedure. 
we need to import it into Preform. Preform is a, is a free to download software that is necessary to prepare our part for printing. So from the software that you use, whether it's ExoCAD, TreeShape, or similar, you need to export this file as an OBJ or STL file. So once you export this, you need to import it into Preform. So this uh, Preform allows to import these two types of, uh, of files, which most of the softwares allow to export in this format. And now the important thing to understand is that this grid is going to be the build platform. It's where our, the object is going to start constructing upon. So what is important to observe here is that we need to orient the surgical guide so the critical anatomical structures are facing away from the build platform. Because as we're going to see, is that uh, we need to add those support structures that will actually uh, allow my printed part to uh, be supported in the build platform. And you will understand this better in the, in the next slide. So after you rent the part, you need to generate the supports, which are little sticks that look like this, and they, this is the raft, that the object will be printed like upside down. So you need to bear in mind that this um, the intaglio surface that will be in contact with the, with the tube structures won't have supports that can later maybe jeopardize the fit of the surgical guide. So you need to also bear that in mind, where to place the support structures in order not to have it maybe in the, also in the insertion of the metal sleeve, keep that clean and away from support structures so they don't affect anything of the fit afterwards in the patient's mouth. So after you rent the part and you added the support structures, you're ready to print. And in this case, uh, we're using the Form 3B, and the only thing that it's needed is to press the orange button, and you select the printer, which is already prepared, uh, but we're going to see how to pre prepare it in the following stage. You upload the job, and then it's ready to go. Then the printer, how this will look like. I send my print job, but I need to prepare my printer. So I first get the cartridge of the resin that I selected in the first stage. I place it in the slot behind the printer because the printer has a slot where the, the cartridge will go. Then we will place the resin tank because this resin tank will receive the resin automatically from that cartridge. The printer uh, uh, takes care of that, of dispensing automatically the resin to the resin tank. And we, pay, and we place the famous build platform, which is necessary in order to uh, our printed part to start constructing upon it. So once we prepared those three th items, the cartridge, the build platform, and the tank, the printer is set up to print. So after all, we leave, we leave the printer to print. It's very straightforward. The printer does the job. But then we have an extra step which you need to consider in 3D printing, which is post-processing. And the post-processing consists of these different steps, which are part removal, rising, drying, post-curing, removing supports, and polishing. So this basically will look like, like the following. We remove, once our printed part is done, as you see here, this is our surgical guide, and it's printed like upside down, as I mentioned. We remove it from the printer, and you need, for the next step, to wash it. To wash it, you can wash it with a build platform or you can remove the parts away from the build platform using a scraping tool. And what you need to do is to wash it in 99% IPA and in this case for 20 minutes. Each of the biocompatible materials have their own specific washing and curing times. And this is important because uh, you need to understand that these steps can also affect the mechanical properties of the printed part. And you need to follow the manufacturer's instructions in order not to jeopardize the final printed part um, overall. So you need to very, uh, read very carefully what are the instructions for washing and curing, not to access the time, uh, otherwise it can damage the part. So it's important once you wash it, this is for example the form wash, it is you just set the time in minutes automatically and then after the wash is done, this basket raises and what you need to do is to allow 30 minutes to dry. Otherwise it can also, if you put it immediately after washing into the form cure, uh, it, would, uh, it can affect the mechanical properties. So you need to do exactly what is the post-curing process in order to achieve the biocompatibility and optimal mechanical properties. So once you did the wash, you need to cure. And the curing times are established prior, again, by the manufacturer, but this is super important because it's when the part will get the optimal mechanical properties. And this case is using the form cure. So after this is done and we finish the washing and curing stage, we need to remove supports. Here they're removing it by hand, but I would suggest using different, uh, different tools, uh, different cutting discs in order to remove the supports just in case. 
And this is how it will look like. And with this technology of low force stereolithography, this support removal is even easier. Like if you do it by hand, it's super easy in the end. So after you remove the supports, you then need to follow to the next step, which is the assembly and delivery. So once you remove the supports, you can use different uh, rubbers or discs in order to polish to high optical uh, characteristics of the surgical guide. Then you need to insert the metal sleeve and then you can steam autoclave the surgical guide. And also the manufacturer establishes different uh, guidelines in order to, to sterilize the, the, the surgical guide. But this is very important. So we guarantee during the surgical guide, we have a completely uh, sterilized context to, to place an implant. So you will see that throughout the process and during the different stages, the material can also shift color and a little bit more in, in, the, in the, how crystal it looks. This is normal and actually it's a good indication to know in which step of the workflow you are. So once that is done, we're ready to use our surgical guide in the, in the patient uh, to, to place our implant. So, but also to bear in mind, aside surgical guides, which is a very wide use application, you might already be using it. We need to understand that 3D printing is always evolving and the future lays on the new dental materials. And we will be seeing this more and more in the future. So what other applications are out there that we can use for implantology? So overall, we can divide this uh, and we will see maybe more in the future. Uh, it can be applications regarding custom impression trays and temporary and permanent restorations. So why custom impression trays? One of the things that you need to understand is that uh, custom impression trays, we are seeing, although we are still present, and why? Because intraoral scanners are getting better and better with time. Maybe they will, we will reach a stage where oral impressions will be digital, but yet there are still some clinical situations like full edentulous cases or depending on the intraoral scanners um, uh, brand or model that you have, how good it can register the, the anat patient's anatomy for the application. It depends on so many variables that we still are dependent using custom impression trays. So just to give you a reference of different research studies, so you can uh, print open or closed trays with, uh, for example, this material custom, uh, custom, custom tray resin from Formlabs. And actually there are research studies that say, yes, you, you can still use, you should still use custom impression trays because it will allow you to have uh, smaller linear displacements. Or for example, Dr. LaRusso, says that you can use, for example, your intro scanner for clinical procedures. So we're going to see this advance more and more in the future, but this is still custom impression trace, a widely used clinical resource. And at least for today, it's, we still need to use them. But we also have other materials coming up, which are temporary and permanent restorations. We are using today a lot of milling machines to produce this, but we're going to see more and more 3D printing coming into, into the field for this application. So, Formlabs actually released a big old temporary crown and bridge and, and permanent coming soon that uh, we can use for clinical applications. And one important thing to understand is that one of the things that we need to analyze from the materials perspective is that the material needs to have fillers in order to be able to resist the wear resistance and have a good wear resistance and also be optically stable and be pos the possibility of being able to polish it at high gloss and custom and characterization. And these new materials for 3D printing are already there. But yes, we're going to see this more and more in the future. And actually the advantage that has over milling machine is that for 3D printing, you don't need to consider the milling radius compensation. And also the, the cost that it has, it's actually going to be uh, more economical than milling more and more and more in the future as we see. So also another study by, all, again, Dr. LaRusso, uh, he's very advocate for uh, studying a lot of the digital workflows and materials. So we know that uh, we're going to see this more and more in the future. So he's still using, and as you see, his research study of digital versus conventional workflow for the fabrication of multi-unit fixed prosthesis. So we're going to be seeing that how you can compare maybe our conventional techniques that we were taught in dental school and how this compares to the digital workflow. So he says that digital technologies offer a reliable, a reliable alternative to conventional techniques. So we need to also compare how the new digital solutions are compared to the conventional workflow and what advantages it brings overall. But we need research to back up this data. And as we see here, we, there's already some published uh, research in different uh, dental magazines that we can base ourselves on, but we're going to see more and more of this. So now proceeding to the next point about workflow combinations of in-house production and outsourcing. 
we need to understand that the digital workflow is composed of different steps, as we saw, of imaging, internal scanning, registering our patient, designing, manufacturing, that it can be mailing or 3D printing, and then the final delivery to the patient. What we need to know is that if you haven't adopted yet the digital workflow, uh, my piece of advice would be don't get overwhelmed by adopting all the steps of the workflow at once. You are still free to adopt each of the steps as necessary. So if we look at the two tracks and we are in the dental practice, we have the patient visit. So we can decide whether to take, take an intro scan of our patient, as we see here, or take a manual impression and send it to the lab, as we see here in the track on the right. Once we send it to the lab, for example, the lab can do the design in the CAD software. But if you decided to adopt this workflow in-house, for example, uh, and you wanted to take the challenge of, of adopting the software skills, uh, then you can do also the design in-house. Then if you dis did the design in-house, you can 3D print it in your printer in your office. Or you can have your lab printed or mill it according to your standards. But also if you have the printer and you didn't decide to do the software part, you can still receive the STL file from your dental lab and print it in your printer. So the advantage actually is reducing the amount of transportation that it's going to be uh, back and forth overall. So once you printed uh, your surgical guide or your lab did so, the lab will logically then send it out to our practice to carry out the treatment. But if we also decided to take this in-house, then great, we are able to do that everything of the workflow in-house. But it's very important first not to be overwhelmed and be knowledgeable of how much time you want to dedicate overall to adopting the different steps. And it has a learning curve as we're going to see in the next slides. As a, and we're just five minutes away for closing the presentation. So this I'm going to be talking about main takeaways and important things to bear in mind. So first of all, what to consider when going digital in implantology? Maybe you, some of you already have this workflow, but for those of you who haven't, haven't adopted yet, what is important is that you need to understand that it's a flexible workflow, that it has a learning curve, not only for us professionals, but also for a dental team. We need to bear that in mind because sometimes we will be delegating post-processing or some part of the stages to our staff. So we need to uh, be conscious of, uh, of that learning curve. Also, we need to evaluate the return on investment because yes, these are digital tools which are very useful. Sometimes they can be uh, more expensive, uh, but it has a, we need to evaluate how much time it would take to, to give us back our investment and uh, in order to justify that uh, initial costs. So then we need to know that there are new skills to acquire, that there's a practice structure, time and space and team to consider, and there, there are some resources needed uh, to acquire the workflow. And this is something that you need to consider. If you're adopting 3D printing, it's good to set up a specific space. So we didn't visualize this in the dental practice before, but we see here that we have a specific setup for 3D printing and this will be the ideal. So you need to consider also the practice space. Then how to go digital overall, choose your starting application. You can start with surgical guides and then start acquiring custom trays, temporary crown and bridge, whatever you prefer, but don't feel overwhelmed of taking everything in house at once. Choose what to take in-house and want to outsource. You can delegate the design to the lab. If you want to adopt it later, you can do so. It's flexible. Get your dental team on board, get trained. That's my overall take. Acquire the resources necessary. Again, get trained. Uh, plan to expand to new applications. And overall, as a, as a summary, we need to also compare it to what we already know, which are the traditional workflows. And just to summarize, and this is the source of of the team of uh, Puluru and, and, and collaborators that we see that the digital workflow has less steps and less steps means less prone to error and less prone to error actually allows us to potentially avoid uh, back and forth with the dental lab or making a, a treatment plan be delayed because we didn't, we, because we have a mistake throughout the way. So we need to consider that we are reducing the amount of steps in the workflow and overall, as a summary, advantages and challenges that the digital workflow has. So we're affecting the patient experience, not only for 3D printing, but also regarding the intraoral scanning. We know that that is very, it's crucial part for a patient. No risk of deformation of impressions, reduced time of surgical act because we place the implant completely guided and that actually reduces the time that we need to decide some, uh, they're taking some decisions clinically. It's easy to adopt. It's a simplified and flexible workflow. It improves efficiency, reducing chair times and delivery and cost savings. 
it allows us for k digitalization so we can uh, it allows us wherever we are i'm in berlin you are in, in india someone is in the us we can transport the information more freely and that it has a high return on investment and the challenges yes there's a learning curve start with one application and scale we you need to consider the practice structure and management regarding time and space you need to acquire skills and training whether it's intro, good intro scanning uh, always the basis of good impression are the same whether conventional or digital uh, have the CAD software skills acquired and the printing knowledge, of course, in order to take the decision as we talk about that layer hide when you sacrifice the time and surface finish. You need to understand the digital workflow as an overall, get your dental team on board, and yes, their initial costs as part of the challenges. But that is basically, I try to be within the time slot, and uh, I hope that this was a good summary of what 3D printing, how is important to acquire this new technology in the practice and the challenges that we're facing as professionals in the future. So thank you so much and looking forward for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Elisa. Thank Perfect, we're starting with the first question. We have a question uh, from Dr. Shilpa. How do you stabilize surgical guides intra-orally in completely edentulous cases? Yeah. So this is a very good question and in fact, quite challenging. Uh, there are different techniques to do so. Actually, one of the very nice techniques is from Digital Smile Design that they have like click on guides that actually allow you to, they have different pins. You can design in the software, you have edentulous cases, different, um, different slots where you can uh, stabilize the surgical guide with pins. But also there are so many different techniques. Again, for example, one is from Digital Smile Design where they have the click on guide, which I think is a fantastic concept that you can, uh, it's very, of course, digital smile design, you, the smile design designs where the implant will go, is going to be placed. And I think that they create the guide based on that smile design. And I think it's brilliant because it guides you afterwards, the surgical guide, and then how to stabilize. And they offer also design services as far as I'm concerned. But there are uh, many different techniques and it also, uh, you can customize the design the software in order to consider this additional retention elements in your surgical guide. Thank you, doctor. Thank you for answering the question. We, we, we move to the next question. The question yep. says, I would like to be trained in digital workflow, especially designing aspects of dentistry. Hmm. So this is actually something very pertinent. Uh, I think this actually one comment, this will be a challenge for future uh, generations and universities, maybe to start including digital workflows uh, more and more in the curricula. So the learning curve is less intensive, but uh, I can tell you that for acquiring the digital workflow, Research is always a good source of information. Uh, Formlabs, for example, has a, a, a lot of educational resources regarding clear liner production, basics of 3D printing. I would suggest if you're new to 3D printing, first start understanding the technology so you can do a good judgment call if this uh, will fit adequately in your practice. You need to understand that as a whole. But digital workflow, consider that uh, there are different steps and you need to see what it justifies from your practice perspective, if to adopt internal scanning now, if to adopt 3D printing, if to adopt software or not, or both or individually. But my suggestion would be consult research, check the resources about basics of 3D printing more in depth, like 3D hubs that I shared, and also different uh, printer companies, software companies, internal scanning software uh, companies, Exocad, 3Shape, they all have a lot of educational resources, formulas again. So it's a matter, you, the, the information is out there but sometimes it can be overwhelming. Just don't get overwhelmed and start with one application that is highly interesting for you. That would be the best way to, to channel your interest in, in digital workflows. Thank you, doctor. We move to the next question. For a okay. 3D printing enthusiast, but who's not from the dental background, what will be the learning curve to work or set up a dental lab using digital workflow? Well, that's an excellent question, which I have has different things to consider as I showed in one of the last slides. So the learning curve, it's a matter of training, training and training. So if you're a dental lab, I believe that you will also want to adopt software skills. I think that for the printer perspective, the ease of use and as uh, the, all the dental professionals that I, we have been working with, myself manipulating the printer, I can tell you that it's very easy to use and the dental staff will get on board with the workflow pretty much easy. The thing is that it depends. The printing stage, I can talk at least for Formlab side in, in that case, is very easy to use. What will have a more steep learning curve 
is the software skills. So you need to decide which software you want to use. And there are a lot of, also a lot of re, uh, research studies that compare the learning curve adoption by different professionals of different softwares. But the overall conclusion is that yes, as long as you get the training, the learning curve will get faster and faster. You just need to uh, know that you, there's a training required because these are new skills that we didn't receive uh, on, under formal dental education. So we need to understand that. we. Some of us grew with computers and it might be easy, uh, but I think that also uh, you need to consider learning curve as our overall. Intro scanning has a learning curve, but it's pretty much easy to use. But uh, in my personal opinion, software skills are the hardest, like the steepest learning curve. But it take one application and then start. Start maybe model production. You can clean the meshes, the STL files, and then start. You can don't feel overwhelmed of acquiring everything at once. So you see that learning curve; it's much easier, and you get more comfortable with the technology. Thank you, doctor. I think that was a wonderful uh, reply to the question. We move to the next question. I didn't understand the part after loading the cartridge into the printer. Can you please explain the same? Yeah. So after, so I didn't understand the part after loading the cartridge into the printer. So the printer has three things that you need to consider. So you place a cartridge that has the liquid resin, you need to place the tank. The tank is important because the printer will automatically dispense the liquid resin in the cartridge into that tank. That tank is what we saw in some of the animations before, will contain the liquid resin prepared to be in contact with the build platform. The build platform is the third element you need to consider in order to uh, be able to print. So. You place a cartridge, which afterwards, if you need to change to another resin, it's very easy. You just remove the cartridge from, from the printer. You also remove the tank because once you use that tank, that tank is dedicated to that resin. So if you want to use, instead of surgical guide, you want to use model resin, then you need to place another cartridge, which has this other material, another resin tank in order to have that liquid resin, because you, in order to avoid cross-contamination, you cannot combine uh, non-biocompatible materials like for model production with biocompatible ones so you also need to bear that in mind uh, but that are the elements once the part is finished because you set up the printer then you need to wash the part and cure it wash it to remove the excess of resin and cure it so the final mechanical properties are achieved for that printed part it's it's very extensive uh, I hope that this was a, a sort of clear explanation, but within the printer process, those are the three elements, cartridge, tank, build platform, and then post-processing. Thank you, Dr. Elisa. We move to the next question. Does CAD-CAM have any faults? Does CAD-CAM have any faults? Well, one of the things I think is that CAD-CAM, it reduces a lot of the errors that we have, like general CAD-CAM, right? Computer-assisted design and computer-assisted manufacturing. So overall, I think that digital workflows are allowing us to reduce the error. We know that we're humans, we have manual skills and we are prone to errors, but technology also is. But in my experience, one of the things that I have seen is that it is prone to errors, but it's also user responsibility in that case. So for example, intro scanning is a great tool, but if we don't know how to use it and we don't follow the technique of correct intro scanning, we're going to have a bad basis and a bad, a bad model in order to produce our design and to be able to print. So overall, what we need to understand is that, yes, it's prone to error, but I see that it's more from a user uh, responsibility and performance, the error that is acquired by CAD-CAM. So, and of course there are software bugs and sometimes it can happen, but in my opinion, CAD-CAM is becoming less and less prone to error uh, with each update, with each year that it happens and each technology that appears. But as users, we need to understand, just like we were trained to take conventional impression, we need to understand that also the internal scanning technique is very, it's, uh, very easy to register and uh, helps us a lot, but we still need to follow a protocol. And protocols are still fundamentally and, and, and very useful in our clinical practice. And this is despite conventional or digital workflow or a hybrid method of both. Thank you. We move to the next question. How long will it take to learn CAD after, spe after the specializations? Uh, I wish to have a setup of my own. Mm -hmm. So after your, you can, if you're doing your specialization, you can still, you can already start if you're doing, for example, 
uh, implantology, you can already start maybe exploring with different softwares. I know that you have, for example, Blue Sky Bio. You can already start to doing your own designs and implant placement, but you pay, you pay for export the case. But there are already digital tools uh, that you can use, for example, in order to start exploring your CAD skills. And also, I would suggest that you choose which software to use and then maybe try to get a training in that software. But I think that it's important for you to maybe start with what is out there already. For example, you can also start with a model. If you have an intro kind of a model, you can use other softwares or free to download softwares if you're new, like Mesh Mixer or Blender, where you can clean the SQL file, the, 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 the digital file, and see how you feel with the process. And then you can start exploring, okay, I want to do surgical guides. Then I meet, maybe I need an, a software like ExoCAD or 3Shape or Blue Sky Bio, you need to also explore that. So you can already start today, already with CAD. You need to first know what the technology is the basis in order to master it. So there is no start or beginning, it's a continuation. If you want to start today, although you're doing your specialization, you can already start. That's my piece of advice. Thank you. We move to the next question. Uh, do these equipments generate a lot of heat? Do they need a temperature controlled environment? Okay, so this is a very good question. So, for example, the resin in the in the in the printer is heated. Yes, uh, you need a mostly for a ventilation system. If you're having also the post processing, because we have IPA and that that can uh, evaporate, and we need to have a good ventilation system. It's mostly also because of the post processing stage. So the printer heats, and once the printer is off, it it, it cools down but it, it, they have a very controlled environment overall. What I would suggest is to consider is the setup uh, and have like a ventilation system, especially for the IPA. That would be like my overall suggestion. Think about it, not only printing, but also like what uh, solvents we're, you're using for, for, for manipulating the printer or creating the parts. Thank you. A uh, question which is uh, not really a part of the topic, but if, if you, if you give me the permission, I can ask you. It says, how can the future of CAD CAM be effective in the field of dentistry other than implantology? Uh, can I please know this? Yes, so the future of CAD CAM is going to be other than implantology, I think that we're seeing a huge advancement overall. I, I think that there are different areas. For example, orthodontics is going to, it's tremendously benefited by this. For example, today with the production of models for clear aligners, indirect bonding trays, uh, and well, custom impression trays we talk, which is not only exclusively from uh, implantology, but other, maybe you don't have an intro scanner, but you still want to produce uh, the tray. But also, for example, um, uh, prosthodontics overall the, with produced, uh, uh, for example, 3D printed or milled uh, dentures, uh, permanent temporary restorations, and also maxillofacial prosthetics because, uh, and I think that also for surgical procedures in maxillofacial surgery, uh, there are some other applications that are used more in the medical side that I think that they're tremendously being benefited by, by CAD CAM and it overlaps that medical area with dentistry overall. And uh, I think that we're going to see more and more in the future. I think more and more of our procedures are going to be covered by this. But again, I think that the challenge resides in the dental materials. We have the technology, but we need to, uh, aside using uh, acrylics, composites, um, uh, ceramics, we're starting to see a new generation of dental materials. So the question is, will we have time to sell, set gold standards in the future now? So overall, I think that uh, each more and more areas are going to be covered, but at least orthodontics and prosthodontics are the highly impacted areas today. Thank you, doctor. We move to the next question, a question that we've received on another uh, platform. It says, uh, what is the setup? What is the total setup cost and what kind of service is required, if any? Yes. So this is a very good question. Again, the setup cost, it varies because again, it depends if you're adopting trial scanning, if you, adopt, um, if you adopt software, you have licenses for the software or 3D printing. There is a wide range, as I showed, according to the technology, DLP, SLA, and you have a lot of brands around, it varies according to price. And is what I can tell is that for formula side is a very cost effective solution because for under uh, approximately depends on the printer that you choose. But for example, for 5,000, 6,000 uh, euros, I can tell that as a uh, reference, you can already set up 
completely. And I would suggest, yes, always that you need to consider service. For example, Formlabs has a lot of, of partners that provide training uh, and assistance via them in regions where we don't, we are not uh, involved directly. And they're super, uh, they were trained by Formlabs. And I think that you need, there are a lot of costs. It's very hard to establish one cost because there are so many software, so many intro scanners, so many different manufacturing systems that it, it is, it can be, it can vary a lot actually. So it's a, uh, it's a matter of finding the best cost effective solution according to your applications. Thank you, doctor. We move to the last question of the question and answer session. Uh, is biocompatible resin a mandate for surgical guide or a slight cheaper resin and sterilized in autoclave can serve the purpose? Okay. This is a very good question. What I say is yes, we need to have a biocompatible resin because these materials are tested for being non-sensitizers, no irritation, and we know that this material won't affect the, the patient overall. Yes, biocompatibility for me, it's, a, it's mandatory and it should be used in order to guarantee patient safety at its most. Uh, and also uh, one of the things that it's important, for example, surgical guide resin, it is registered as a medical device in Europe and the US. And it's, uh, it has a specific intended use for the placement of Im uh, dental implants. Uh, so it's important to also bear in mind that this material has also been tested for the final intended use and that we know that after it goes washing and curing, the mechanical properties are still okay for that application. We need to understand that, of course, we have the resin, but also that the final part is good and developed and appropriate for the in intended use. It's not uh, an, another resin in order to guarantee that we're going to have good results because we have digital technologies, but again, patient safety is our most important aspect in the practice and to deliver a uh, very nice experience. And also the material selection in, in my opinion is to be biocompatible, that it's registered and that it's uh, established for its intended use and can, for example, surgical guide be autoclave. So for me, those are uh, uh, material selection uh, those are the critical things to look at when you're choosing which material to use.